And we welcome Sally Armstrong back to TVO, author of Bitter Roots, Tender Shoots, The Uncertain Fate of Afghanistan's Women. There's been so much conversation uh, and discussion, debate, about this new law in Afghanistan, and I'm not sure everybody really knows what's there and what's conjecture. Do you know? Can you tell us what's in this law? No wonder people don't know. Karzai doesn't want anyone to know, because how could he, as his associate said, tinker with it if it was already law? Here's what I know. I spoke to women in the lower house. They said the law was brought into the lower house for discussion, as one would expect in a parliament. But as soon as a woman complained about the law, she was accused of being un-Islamic. And Steve, that's a very serious accusation in Afghanistan. That's blasphemy, and you can be put to death for blasphemy. So they stopped their complaints. The law was taken on, presumably, to the upper house. The women I spoke to said it was never presented to the upper house. Then Karzai said he signed it. Then his associate said, we're not going to make the law public until we've had time to tinker with it. This was a cheap piece of electioneering. Why would Karzai do this, given that he has been sort of seen as the world as this great champion of more liberal democratic values? I know. Isn't he seen as the champion? Even by me, until now. I mean, here he is, very theatrical man with his Persian uh, fur cap and his tribal cape and singing the praises of the women. And then he sold them out. Because the presidential elections are coming up in August, mm -hmm. and there are two or three credible candidates who are going to run against him. And I'll bet you he was crunching the numbers. And he decided that in order to stay in power, he was going to have to sell out the women. So he's working on his Islamist flank, as it were. Exactly. Hmm. Uh, is this law actually going to pass, do you think? I think the law is already toast. You know, the value in, in this hoorah around the world is that this time, the international community drew a line in the sand. When the Taliban did this, everybody looked the other way. And the Taliban got away with it. But this time, NATO particularly, and I have to say Canada's Prime Minister Harper was the one who led it, said, hold on a minute, we have certain values, and, and you have to observe those values. So the international community, you think at the end of the day, because of its pushback, got this thing torpedoed? I do. And I, I think that there's been a problem throughout this mission that was never addressed until now, and it is this. When people, when a, if I, you say to me, this is my culture, this is my religion, it's none of your business, I back off. I'm politically correct and I back off. But these extremists have in fact hijacked the culture and the religion uh, for political opportunism, and no one's calling them on it. Now they've been called on it. Well, let me follow up on this. We've got a clip here from Al Jazeera's English service, which will, I guess, talk in broader detail about some of the uh, traditional customs and how they influence the day-to-day -day rights of Afghan women. Michael, if we can, let's roll that clip. Human rights groups argue laws do little to protect women in this country, and at times it's Afghan tradition that gives them even fewer rights. The legal age of marriage is 16. A large number of Afghan girls marry well before. Up to 80% of those marriages have been forced. That is the story of this 13-year-old girl whose father handed her over to repay a gambling debt. He owed $5,000 to this 50-year-old man, Muhammad Asif. Muhammad says he is not sure if she is happy about the marriage, but it's not up to her anyway. Now, you're always leery about allowing one story to represent you know, too much, to broadening it out too much, but how representative is that of Afghan culture today? That is absolutely representative. That law he was referring to, or she was referring to, is called bad. So if your tribe fights with my tribe, and, and I lose, I have to give you a little girl to make amends, maybe two or three little girls, depending on the size of the harm done. The women in Afghanistan are living with exactly the items that, that the Karzai law has been asking for anyway. But the reformers, who are women, journalists, women, human rights activists, lawyers, teachers, they're the ones that are going after the people to change these laws. And they're being successful and Karzai would claw that back with this kind of thing. There must be women, though, who support Sharia law, are there not? Well, you can support Sharia law. The problem with that is it is implemented by mullahs who are uneducated and can't even read the Quran. I mean, there's nothing in the Quran to support what the Taliban did. There's no place in the Quran that says a woman can't go to work or a girl can't go to school or even that you have to cover your face. Mm. 
but they make it up and with a 85 percent illiterate population you can get away with that but given all of the western influence military development and so on over the past several years what is it now eight years since they've been in afghanistan are things a little better for afghan women these days well yes they are but you see we focus most of our reporting on the four southern provinces where the insurgency is going on there's 34 provinces in afghanistan and in the other 30 i mean steve they have confounding problems to solve but they are marginally better off and every year they're a little better than the year before and women are back at work six million kids are back in school almost three million well 2.5 million of them are girls there's a, there's a, an independent human rights commission they have miles to go but things are marginally better here's something we got to our website tvo.org somebody wrote in and said the following some of you may not be aware how recently Canadian law was changed in cases involving a husband forcing sex upon his wife until 1982 a man in Canada could not be charged with raping his wife to a considerable degree ours has been a patriarchal society too which I guess raises the question, are we asking Afghan society to liberalize uh, perhaps more quickly than they can? And, you know, we ought to get off our soapbox because we're not that good on this issue either. Well, she makes a point. It was 1983, actually, when marital rape became a law in Canada. But it did change here. The, the second wave of the women's movement began in the 60s. And look at the changes. When I was married in 1967, a woman was expected to say, I obey, when she took her marriage vows. A married woman couldn't open a bank account without her husband's signature or go to the hospital or take her kids for treatment. So we've come a long way. And now a women's movement has started in Afghanistan. And it's almost exactly as it was here in terms of the movement, as it was here in the 60s. And they are moving ahead, which is why I, I claim they are the reformers. And yes, it takes time, but it also takes support. Can they be open about it? Yes, they're open about it, but they're threatened. I mean, the Taliban, who I normally dismiss as dumb as doorknobs, even the Taliban are smart enough to know these women are the ones to fear because they are reforming the laws. Um, and the Taliban are, are murdering them uh, in a ritualistic style. I mean, this so, is the difference here. I mean, you had a women's movement in Canada, obviously, back yeah, when. Some people may have disagreed with us, but they didn't kill us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you take and your in life Afghanistan, and they will. Hmm. Well, here's another one, another email that we got. What to do? If this law is allowed to pass as described, the writer says, I would expect our troops to be withdrawn immediately. This is not like other countries where we stand back, do nothing, and claim there is nothing we can do. What do you say to Canadians who are losing faith with our involvement in Afghanistan when they hear stories about laws being passed like this? Well, there's two sides to that. Number one, um, if you withdraw the troops, you have civil war within 24 hours, and heaven help the women then heaven help them. But the other side of it is the international community applied the pressure they should have been applying all along. They did it right. The law is toast. I can, I can guarantee that law is gone. And it's because the international community said, no, we've come to the end of our rope. Afghanistan has signed all the same conventions, declarations, charters at the UN that Canada has signed. So it's about time someone said you have to be accountable. So we may not like their values, but you think bringing the troops home would be the wrong thing to do? Um, I think that without security, you can't do anything. You can't even run a school without security. So I think uh, they would be in a lot of trouble if the international community pulled out. When you talk to Afghan women, when you're there, you've been there how many times now? Oh, a lot. I'm there a couple of times a year, over 12 years. Okay, lots. Is there one thing in particular when you talk to Afghan women that they say, this is what we want above all else? You know, that's so amazing. Because you think you'd get this treaty about, I want the following six mm -hmm. governmental things. They say to me, I want to be like you. I want to go and visit my sister without asking permission. I want to go to my workplace without someone telling me I have to bar the window. They want basic freedoms. And you know, particularly because of what's gone on in the last decade, they know other people don't live like this, and, and they want their peace of living, too. Do you see this happening? I do. You think it's I, happening? I believe there's a good news chapter yet to write about Afghanistan. They're amazing people when you get to know them, and their women have been treated so badly throughout their history. And I think these women 
have come together and they're going to chase down a better life for their daughters and I think they just need support. In which case do you think that our efforts over there are really making a difference in their lives? Absolutely and again because we we write so much about the insurgency which we need to it's our men and women who are in harm's way but do you know Canada one year ago yesterday Canada gave five million dollars for the reform of family law and I followed those people I went to the meetings I watched it's happening it's working and then Karzai pulls a stunt like this but it is the work it's Canada that invested in the Independent Human Rights Commission which is seen as a stunning success story. I mean, they're not there, and they're miles from where we would see mm -hmm. as accomplishing their goals, but things are marginally better, and you can see the way forward if someone could just uh, get the extremists out of the way. Well, this is the thing. You're off the Karzai bandwagon now pretty clearly, but is there a better alternative? There are. There, there are credible people who are, are either running or considering running for the presidency, but you know, they're so new at this. They've never done this before. They've made huge mistakes. The government is incredibly corrupt. But they need to learn, and they need to learn by their mistakes. And they need to be able to yank this thing forward. Just finally, what more should this country be doing? Steve, I think Canada's done a lot, a huge amount, uh, with our military, certainly, who have been doing a fabulous job. No one took them to Insurgency 101 school. This was a learn-by-doing mission. And we've invested enormously in humanitarian aid, reconstruction. Canada's done a lot in Afghanistan. Do we need to do more? I think we need to stay the course. Stay the course it is. Okay. Sally Armstrong, always good of you to visit us at TVO. Thanks so much. Thank you.